welcome to our 14th Brain Power Session. It was a marathon two weeks, going through 13 topics, and here we are seeking some clarity by asking questions. Before we go to the questions, please allow me to, go, to give you a summary of the frontal lobe hits that form the basis of this uh, series. There are 14 well-researched hits to the frontal lobe. And we will briefly look at another two very obvious ones during this session. Well, the first one we looked at was a lack of water. So if I'm not drinking enough water, I need to know that 85% of my my brain's uh, liquid is water, and so uh, my brain is not going to function the way that it should if I get myself dehydrated. Another uh, hit is a raised carbon dioxide level. So deep breathing or not deep breathing would actually cause my brain not to have the, um, the oxygen that it needs, and so there would be a raised carbon dioxide level. And we also looked at things that we take in that, uh, that adds to the load of, uh, of carbon dioxide. And that really is not what our brain needs. Uh, we also looked at poor blood flow as a, as a hit to the brain. And um, this uh, is affected by our our blood circulation, so water does also play a role, yeah, but things like sugar and fats and uh, so on would actually cause poor blood, f blood flow and the oxygen and the uh, energy would not get to the brain cells and that would uh, compromise my thinking and my cognitive um, um, uh, behavior. The, uh, the fourth one that we looked at is poor nutrition. And so we said, you know, we, we find in our Western society, we've got a lot of food on the table, but very little nutritional value. And so we need to start looking at what we are eating so that we would actually feed our brain. The normal Western diet does not help at all to make our brain work properly. And then in the fifth place, we looked at drugs. And this means legal and illegal drugs. We get so used, we got so used to, to using uh, drugs for, for everything. And, you know, and, and stimulants, you know, plays a role here as well. And um, that has a direct effect on our brain. So uh, we also looked in uh, the sixth point, we looked at sexual arousal and how this, especially outside of marriage, could have a direct effect on our mental capacity. So we want you to know this is a very overlooked topic uh, in our society. We also looked at other uh, things like hypnosis, uh, lack of abstract thinking. So, you know, we, we are so bombarded with all the information, television, our cell phones and, and whatever, that we, we never sit down and think, abstractly think about things. We're just exposed to everything. And this could be a compromise to our, our frontal lobe action. We also uh, found that uh, going against your conscience is, uh, is a frontal lobe hit. So if you know something is wrong, but you go and do it. And that would have an effect on your performance. You know, one would just think, well, this is just, you know, uh, you know, a Christian sort of um, criteria. No, you know, you could be from whatever faith. If there is always the sense this is wrong and you go and do it and it would make you not perform the way that you should and could. Another one is uh, a low carb diet. A big problem today because we've got all these diets coming up and saying, you know, low carb, high protein diets, high fat diets. And uh, this is really not what our brain needs to, to be optimally working. So we, we need to understand that the, the food, the energy to our brain is basically glucose. And uh, that is derived from from uh, carbohydrate diet. 
So, and we're speaking here of, of uh, unrefined carbs. I do have a problem with all the, the white stuff where all the fiber is taken out and we've just got the energy component. We don't have the, the, the slow release triggers uh, of fiber and that would cause you know, sugar spikes. And we, we know that sugar spikes causes inflammation and other things that, that causes havoc in our system. So, yeah, let's go for unrefined uh, uh, carbohydrates in, in, our, in our diet. Then we also looked at, um, uh, at, at media things like television. And, and I don't want you, you know, if this is the first time you look at this, I don't want you to say, whoa, 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 wait. If he says television, I don't want to look further to this. We are saying there's some programs that we see that we are exposed to on television that would actually compromise our frontal lobe. Um, there is music that would compromise our frontal lobe. So there's music that would stimulate us to remember, to think. But there's other music that would bypass that, go to the limbic system, and it would just go to the, to the feeling centers, and uh, the cognitive part is compromised. And so, yeah, you know, the problem is we, 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 we sit, um, especially our younger people, sit with earphones in their ears, listening to music that's not enhancing their brain function, and uh, we see bad performance, and we can't understand why this is happening. We also see that cell phones could be a, a high risk factor for, for hits to the frontal lobe. And it's the programming. It's the, it's the, it's the time that we spend with this. It is the, 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 the non-thinking parts that are compromised. And um, it's the type of things that we are stimulated with, with uh, cell phones. Uh, we also spoke about the radiation of the cell phones, and that has an effect on our brain and, uh, and mental capacity. And then uh, some, one that's very interesting, I think this intrigued many, is the lack of scriptural study. Uh, so, you know, if your brain is stimulated by, by studying scripture on a regular basis. And we find those that are practicing this, they do much better than others. They do not practice it. We also um, want to share some bonus hits with you. I think it's all, um, it's obvious that when you get physical damage to your frontal lobe, that it would be compromised. And so the, 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 um, the advice is always, you know, when you get on a bicycle, because you could fall off at speed and then knock your head and, and that could be damaged. Wear a helmet. When you go on a motorbike, you know, the law says wear a helmet. And this is the reason. We don't want you to, to be damaged physically uh, on your frontal lobe. And then we also know that sleep deprivation is a frontal lobe hit. We've not looked at it in the series because of time factors, but um, this is a very important one. I have seen people that were um, uh, sleep depraved that actually lost uh, the, their connection with reality. And uh, th this is a real threat. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's spend our time in this session looking at some of the questions that were asked by those that have attended the program in the last two weeks or so. And uh, the first question is, I'm a young man and I've always had problems sleeping at night. What could I do? Would this have an effect on my brain function? Now, I need to state that in my years of experience in this field, I've learned that a healthy body naturally sleeps well. When I get to a point where I need to use um, sleeping aids and, and what we mean, mean by that is sleeping pills, things that would help me to sleep, tranquilizing um, sleeping pills, um, then, then it is a sure sign that there is, there is a problem. I know that all the people that have been on medications to help them sleep, when they, when they looked at the principles that I'm just going to share now, uh, and they've changed their lifestyle accordingly, um, they did not need those sleeping aids anymore. 
So I could also state that research is clear that the lack of good sleep is definitely another hit on the frontal lobe. So this young man asks, what could I do? Firstly, what do we mean by a good, sufficient sleep? Well, it means for adults at least seven to eight hours of sleep per night. For children, this could be eight to nine hours per night. So what is effect if one does not get enough sleep? So what happens? Well, sleep deprivation makes us moody and irritable and it impairs brain function, such as memory and decision making. If I'm tired, I am not going to make good decisions. I, I'm not even going to be able to drive my car the way I should. And so there's many studies now, you know, comparing um, people that are tired sleep uh, uh, while they're driving and others that are under the influence of alcohol driving. And uh, there's a very similar pattern. So it is also negatively impacting the rest of our body, you know, the sleep deprivation. It impairs our function of our immune system. For example, making us more susceptible to infections. Uh, so, so what could be the cause why we're we not sleeping? What causes um, sleeping deprivation or insomnia? And this is how many of us know it. Well, in the, in the first place, sleeping patterns are disturbed when our bloodstream is acid. And that could be caused by refined foods or, or too little water, uh, even overeating, you know, eating more than your body needs, or heavy meals late at night. So I'm not going to, if I eat a late meal, my, my body is not going to shut down and sleep, you know, we, we need to now, our body needs to now digest this food that's in the tummy and it will not go to sleep before it does that. And so my brain does not shut down. And so I am tired. So we need to try and eat our last meal at least four hours before we go to bed. Um, and, and this is not the norm for our Western society. You know, we come back home from work and then we only prepare the meal and then we only eat and then it's late. Um, and so when we go to bed, we've got a tummy full of food. And uh, the moment we start changing this, and I'm warning you, this is going to happen. Um, it's going to feel that, well, I can never go and sleep because it feels like my, my tummy is empty if it's like four hours before. But that will change very quickly if you just get into that rhythm. Too much sugar in any form would actually disturb my sleeping patterns. And then we also know that constipation is, uh, is, a, is a big big problem. Um, <clears throat> so what is very important here is that, you know, we try and, and, and get into a pattern in a, in a circadian rhythm where we would, we would sleep properly. So yeah, there's a, there's a acronym that I normally teach people and that's called new start. New start stands for N nutrition, E for exercise, W for water and the S stands for sunshine, the T stands for temperance, and the A for air, the R for rest, and the T for trust in God. And if I follow these principles, and I set, I have set times for sleeping and waking, I have set times for my meals. We call that the circadian rhythm. If I have that in place, uh, we find that people would, would sleep much better uh, without interrupt, uh, interruptions in their, in their sleep. So I hope that has answered uh, that question that this young man has asked. Um, if uh, he's tried this for a few days and it does not work, then um, please uh, contact me and uh, we can uh, go to a, a second phase of, of information. Well, we've got another interesting uh, uh, thing that I need to just add to this. And um, that is uh, another factor to sleep. And that is that two hours of sleep 
before midnight is equal to four hours after midnight. And there's a very important principle here. There's certain hormones and uh, even hormones to repair our cells that get damaged throughout the day. Um, they get secreted. These hormones get secreted once in a 24 hour cycle. And it happens here between uh, two hours before midnight and just after that. And so when I'm not sleeping at that time, the cell repair does not happen. I've always, um, as a student, thought, you know, I'm a night person. So I would, I would really work hard at night and then just go and sleep for an hour or two and then go to my exam or to my class or whatever. And the moment I've changed my cycle where I would sleep earlier, get up earlier, I've done so much better. Things have just changed. So it's very important that we that we remember that those two hours before midnight is 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 vitally important for for cell repairs and cell rejuvenation and that means for your brain as well. We also found that a 15 minute little rest, little catnap before lunch would make a big big difference in your energy levels later and your 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 mental capacity later so you are you would be brighter we're not saying go and sleep after lunch for hours you're gonna get up and you know that feeling you know with this big head you don't want that just 15 minutes max before your lunch time just go and rest have your lunch and then go into the rest of the day so here's another question important one is there a difference between female and male brains um, interesting questions that we get, and I, I love this. Looking at the physical, the, the total brain size. Men's uh, brains are bigger than women's, but a woman's uh, a hypocampus, uh, that's the, the critical learning and memorization uh, part of the brain, that's larger than a man's and, and works much differently. Um, conversely, a man's uh, amygdala associated with experiencing of emotions and recollections of such experiences is is bigger than than women uh, these are uh, uh, they contain you know especially high concentrations of receptors for for sex hormones um, and yeah obviously men has more of those than women and another key variable is the composition of men versus women's um, stems from those uh, sex chromosomes which which form you know one of the the 23 pairs of human chromosomes in each cell and generally females have two x uh, chromosomes in their pair while main males have a x and a y chromosome so those are some of the differences um, there is cataloged plenty of human behavior differences Women's reading comprehension and writing ability consistently um, exceeds that of men. We are speaking, you know, averages. They outperform men in tests of fine motor coordination and perceptual speed. So this is the reason why, you know, women can do three, four things at, at the same time, where men can do one thing at a time. And, and we need to recognize we are different. Uh, yeah, uh, Women are more uh, adept at retrieving information from long-term memory. And I've learned this from my, my wife. You know, I would, I would have forgotten things and she would remind me, this is it, this is it. So, so women are different. And I believe our Creator has put us together in this way so that we can, you know, complement each other. Navigation studies in both humans and rats uh, showed that females of both these species tend to rely on landmarks, uh, while males more typically they rely on uh, dead reckoning, you know, calculating one's position by estimating the direction and the distance traveled rather than using a landmark. And so the brain of men and women are just just wired a little differently. And this is why, you know, I believe, you know, men and women, you know, are created in such a way that we would complement each other. And... Um, and that's good for, for us. Men on average can uh, more easily juggle items in working memory. 
they have a superior visual uh, spatial skills. They they better at visualizing what happens when uh, a complicated two or three dimension shape is rotated in space at correctly determining angles from uh, the horizontal, at tracking moving objects, at aiming at uh, projectiles. Now, women, you know, don't often, you know, perform in that way. Uh, so I hope this, this answers question, the question, you know, we are different, our brains are different, and um, yeah, we, 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 we should not try and compare each other yeah, so, uh, yeah, I hope that that helps a bit. Here's another question. How can one clear mercury from the brain to eradicate forgetfulness? Well, thank you for this, for this very interesting yet very important question. We firstly have to acknowledge that forgetfulness is not solely because of soft metal toxicity. Uh, it is a human to want to blame someone or something for us not performing well. However, having said that, mercury toxicity does cause forgetfulness. It also causes leaky gut syndrome. It is real. So I don't know if this person had been um, diagnosed if there was blood test done to to pinpoint that this is a challenge but what it means is that we're having poisons we've got mercury we've got uh, pesticides put into our processed foods uh, it lands up there and we eat it and then partly digested foods gets into the blood where it should never be uh, if one has leaky gut, then you may well develop leaky brain as well. So mercury is one of the, the causes of leaky uh, gut and leaky brain syndromes. Um, you, as I say, you did not say if you have had the blood test done to find out if you had high uh, mercury levels. So it's it's difficult to answer the question properly. But if one was tested for and diagnosed with high levels of mercury, I would suggest the following. Number one, remove and avoid the source of contamination. So things like seafoods, high, highly loaded with, with mercury, um, avoid those things. Uh, get your teeth checked. Uh, many times we've got uh, metal amalgams um, and uh, they leak, and so your dentist would be able to, to pinpoint those. In the third place, we, uh, we call it chelation. Uh, so chelation with natural chelators and vitamins. This is, this is a, a procedure that we would follow to get rid of the, the mercury. Uh, you need to consume enough plant protein, those amino acids in protein can facilitate detoxification more effectively. And uh, one thing that's very important in this process is to assure regular bowel movement. So 90% of the mercury that's, that's removed through uh, the, the chelation will pass through our stool. And essentially to have regular bowel movement in order for the chelation to be uh, effective we could use a natural laxative like psyllium seed if it's necessary. But this is, this is a very important factor. So the chelation process is a, is a lengthy business. It's not easy. It could take weeks. It could take months. Um, but we need to do activities that would encourage sweating. That would help it. Um, even uh, steam bathing. Uh, that would help exercise, sunshine, drinking enough water to keep the color of your urine. When you leave it down there in the toilet, it should be a pale straw color. One of the most important cures for toxicity of any sorts is lots of whole grains and fruits and fresh vegetables and legumes like 
peas and beans and lentils, chickpeas, those natural proteins would actually make, uh, make it much easier for you in this chelation process. So let's look at our, our next question. I hope that one is answered well. And once again, if um, more information is needed, uh, you could easily just contact me. So for our next question, you spoke about caffeine and other drugs being hits for the frontal lobe, but you did not mention alcohol. What are the effects of alcohol on the brain and its function? Well, this is a very important question. And yes, we could, we could not go into the details because of time. Uh, but let's go into this swiftly. Let's just look at this um, in, 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 in the few minutes that we have. Alcohol is a, is a neurotoxin. It can poison your, your, your brain. And it has a strong potential to seriously disrupt your, your delicate hormone balance. By just drinking two glasses of alcohol uh, beverage, um, it, it, it causes havoc. It also um, increases the risk of, of cancer. And yes, you know my story. I nearly died of cancer. I never used alcohol. But having had that terrible disease, you know, I would just suggest, you know, leave out, avoid anything that has the potential to make you sick because it's not a good feeling. In the, in the fourth place, large amounts of alcohol causes uh, unstable insulin levels. And high insulin levels causes other lifestyle issues like high blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, diabetes. It is totally linked to inflammatory diseases, all the inflammatory diseases that we know now. It's directly linked to, uh, to high insulin levels. And um, in the fifth place, uh, a study of people in their 50s and 60s, they found a link between... Uh, low to moderate drinking and reduced brain size. So the more drinks you add, the more brain, uh, the brain shrank in size. And uh, this is association with, uh, with men and women. So it's, it's on, on both genders. Uh, in the sixth place, every time you drink, you destroy some brain cells. Uh, th there's a misconception that, you know, this only happens when you get drunk. No, no. You know, that one drink that you drink actually has a negative effect on your, on your brain cells. And then in the seventh place, drinkers are 58 times more likely to commit suicide. We have all types of excuses why we cling to, to, to certain habits and certain, you know, addictions. And, and one excuse that I've, I've heard many times, one reason why we, we, we say, no, it's, it's good, it's healthy, we can use it, is about um, this wine being good for your heart. Uh, now, this was stated in research years back, and uh, they said it was red wine that was so good for your heart. And then they decided it was not the wine, but it was actually the the resveratrol, the, the plant color chemical, that was the secret ingredient. But that color you can get from black grapes and purple fruits without dangers and side effects of alcohol. So why must I have alcohol to have the, the resveratrol into my system that would protect me? And so a year or so ago, uh, they said it was because the test group they ate a lot of fruits and vegetables and not because of the wine. So the fact is we do not have any proof that there's even a little good in wine or in alcoholic beverage for what, uh, for, for, for what it matters. So, so the reality is the, the, the brain damage is caused by alcohol consumption and this damage is permanent. So the risk of consuming alcohol is just too big just to just use it. Uh, something interesting, 
in uh, finalizing this answer to this question, how does the use of alcohol compare with other habits in the brain? And uh, I'm taking you to this uh, graph in the brain. And uh, we see there the uh, prefrontal cortex, that's the frontal lobe. And then we see there the ventral tegmental area, the VTA. And connecting these two areas is the nucleus encumbrance. So when uh, in the brain, we have these different areas, different functionalities. We know the frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex should be in control. We know it is compromised by alcohol. However, something interesting and more that I'm giving you is that between these two is that nucleus and cumbrance area. And there's a very important link in the brain's communication that takes place. And it, it, it takes place through a chemical or a hormone called dopamine. And um, I, I, I need to tell you that the, the nucleus and cumbrance area is dopamine rich. And it regulates that sensation of well-being, of reward. And direct, this is directly affected by alcohol use. So just look at this comparative brain scan. On the left top, we see a normal person's brain. And that brightly colored areas in these images mark the nucleus incumbents. So that's the brain's reward center. The red indicates a high number of receptors for dopamine. That's now the brain chemical that transmits the sensation of pleasure and well-being. And then the yellow and the green indicates few receptors. And we find that people short on dopamine receptors have, they've got difficulty in feeling joy and feeling excited about life and so on. And so many scientists have been surprised by recent studies revealing that the biochemistry of classical uh, addictions like alcoholism, drug abuse, is strictly and strikingly similar to that of compulsive activities, including gambling, overeating, looking at pornography, and so on. So, um, just to, to, to focus on that, um, to, on that graph again, as we said, left top is the, is the normal brain. You can see it is bright orange, bright yellow. And next to that is the brain of an obese person. And you can see there the uh, dopamine levels uh, non-existent. Um, on the left bottom, that is a, a person that is um, addicted to cocaine. You can see it's a very holy brain, and uh, but very low, well, no, no dopamine there. And then the alcoholic, there's there's a slight, slight sign of dopamine there, but very, very low. So um, there is an effect of uh, these chemicals on the brain at the, at the end of the day. So our next question, how long does it take for one's IQ to raise after removing sugar and employing the principles we learned in this series? I love this question. Somebody out there is thinking and making decisions. The time from when you make a lifestyle change, like avoiding all forms of refined sugar. And by the way, we've showed you that there's studies uh, that shows that there's a 25% IQ improvement if you cut out all refined sugars uh, and refined um, sugar um, carbohydrates. So obviously, this differs from person to person. However, interestingly, we have a biblical example of this. And I want to take you there. In Daniel 1 verse 8, Daniel and his friends asked not to eat the normal food, but given only plant foods and water. Remember, we spoke about that in our first session. And we said, you know, you know, we cannot, we cannot say, you know, some, so, somebody is, is, uh, much gifted, more gifted than me, or that. These men were in the most awkward position where they were captives. And 
they were you know forced to do things that they didn't want to do and they they decided in their own hearts we will be able to perform much better if we just have plant foods and water and so they asked for this and the eunuch that was set uh, above them he did not want to accede to this request as he feared for his own life uh, because you know there was this possibility that they would get thinner and they would look unhealthy and that they would not be as bright as their peers and uh, so Daniel and his friends they went to his superior and asked to be given a trial period and Daniel 1 verse 12 says I beg you try your servants 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink test us just for for a week or two and let's see if this diet will work for us if we look thinner if we are paler if we test dumber we will eat the normal food of the king and then we go and we see in verse 15 uh, and at the end of the 10 days their faces looked fairer and fatter in flesh than all the boys who had eaten the king's food so within 10 days you will find a major difference not only looking healthier but even in cognitive performance so what was the longer term outcome so if you carry on with this lifestyle what were the results because i've seen some students you know they would now stop using the sugar and all their sweeties and all that just yeah before exam time and um, you know that will be okay <laughs> well what happens if you would consistently live this lifestyle what happened to this young men they were in the university of babylon and after three and a half years there daniel 1 verse 19 has the answer and uh, look at this now at the end of the days now we've we've worked out it it must have been about three and a half years uh, that the king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So here comes the ultimate test. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king required of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers uh, that were in uh, all his realm. If you diligently will follow and apply the principles, you could be found 10 times wiser than the wisest. People, we are not just created bright or doff. We have an important role to play in expanding our brain capacity and this by our own choice. I know God plays a role here and he helps, but we have to give him permission. We have to cooperate. So this is exciting stuff. Let's get to our next question. I get so excited. Let's get to our next question. If you have small meals, well balanced, but frequently, will it achieve the same purpose as a big breakfast? Well, in session four and five of the Brain Power series, we uh, we looked at this session five power supply we looked at the nurse's study where we saw the effect of eating in between meals and we determined that best cognitive performance is achieved by three or less meals at least five to six hours apart but ideally this must happen in an eight our period so starting the, the day with a good solid breakfast is is the answer eating or snacking outside of this parameter causes the derailing of our digestive system which has a detrimental effect on our cognition so the one suffers and it pulls down the other one so I would like to suggest that you go back 
to the sessions four and five and go and look at the scientific reasons we suggest a solid breakfast rather than nibbling in little pieces. I want you to look at this, this graph with me. And I want to remind you that we want to achieve a slow release energy level. And we want to avoid sugar spikes. So look at the graph where we would have little meals. You'll see that it shoots up the sugar level and it comes crashing down below the norm and it shoots up and it passes the, the norm of, uh, of six and it comes crashing down again. So these numerous sugar spikes throughout the day and uh, we have seen in the series that every time the sugar goes out of the norm, above or in a search at the bottom, it takes about 45 to 75 minutes after the blood sugar has come back to the normal from the spike or from the search for the brain to actually then function optimally again. So what this, does this mean in reality? It means that this constant compromised brain function for many is a reality. Because many people eat snack, snack, and so it goes out, it overshoots, it comes back, it crashes again, they need another snack, and never do they have optimal brain function. And what we've seen is students that have sorted this out, all of a sudden, they're high flyers. They're not scratching like a chicken anymore. Let's go to our next question. What effect does fasting have on my blood glucose level? And more importantly, my brain capacity. Hey, I must say once again, I love these interesting questions. Newest research shows that intermittent fasting has high value not only in uh, general health, but especially brain function. Fasting is defined as abstinence from food for a period of 12 hours or more. Intermittent fasting is achieved by eating all the needed meals in 8 hours of the day and the rest of the time I just drink liquids and so my body and my digestive system digest the food and it goes to rest. Now the outcomes is just so amazing. Stabilized sugar levels are achieved immediately and this assures no sugar searches that affects optimal brain function. So the ideal is to have a slow release energy level, quite the opposite to what the normal Western diet dictates, namely constant sugar spike search, spike search. So yes, practical reminder, once again, we want a slow release energy level. We don't want it to spike up and crash. We want it to be a slow release energy level. And I'm going to do this by following the five principles of keeping your blood sugar level stable. And we've looked at this in session four and five. So just go back and go and revise that, that sessions. Well, our next, our next question. Our next question, what happens to my blood sugar levels if I don't eat early in the morning and only eat between 11 and 12 for the first time, but eat oats and fruit? Well, as I said um, in, the, in the sessions, uh, and I'm going back to session four and five, it seems like we have got a lot of questions about that is that there's much more grains and, and unrefined carbohydrates than, than oats. And uh, many of the oats that we would buy from the shelf is, um, is a refined product. So be careful, because what we will have there is that we could even, with oats and fruit, have a spike because that oats is, is refined. So if it's rolled oats where it's got the germ in, it's got the fiber on still, then it's a different story. This question links uh, to our previous question. Uh, the important factor is to keep the blood sugar levels stable. 
and in a normal range of not above 6, not below 2.9. So we need to just keep it there. If I delay my breakfast till so late in the day, I may cause my blood sugar to drop and even go below the 2.9. And my brain needs a constant supply of, of energy. It must be an uninterrupted power supply. So maybe it's not the best idea to have your, your lifestyle in such a, 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 a position that you only eat your breakfast at that. I would suggest, let me give you an honest uh, opinion of where I am and what I've found over the years, last 20, 22 years, um, helped many people to actually get their blood sugar levels nice and stable. Um, I would have my breakfast at nine o'clock in the morning. Now I'm in the position to be able to do that. You might not because you would be at work, but one must work around that. One must maybe take your food parcel with and, and have your breakfast there. But I have it, and, and, and by the way, the, the nine o'clock is not, you know, holy time. It's, it's not like that is the, the, the only thing. No, no. Um, it's the spacing of it. So you could have it earlier, but your spacing should be right. So I have nine o'clock my breakfast, and I only have my lunch at three o'clock, and then I finished eating for the day. That means from three o'clock right around till nine o'clock tomorrow, that gives you about 18 hours, um, I'm actually fasting. That's what we call intermittent fasting. And so my body gets time to reset. And uh, we find that we even help people with, um, with diabetes, insulin resistant diabetes, um, actually kick out and get things working again by, by just applying this uh, very important principle. Let's go to our next question. What is the recommended substitute for sugar? Well, we need to go for natural sugars. Most fruits have natural sugars, like bananas, um, raisins, dates. Uh, we could use honey in moderation or stevia. Stevia is a plant with an ultra sweet leaf. Um, but there's, there's, a nat, there's, a, there's a number of, of ways to sweeten this bitter life up with, with a little sweetness. Um, but we need to be moderate in this, you know. Um, I think our taste buds are so misformed and um, deformed that, that, you know, we want everything to be very sweet or very salty or very spicy or whatever. And we have to tone down on that. So, yeah, uh, I, I've not been using sugar for um, 20, 24, two years, uh, sugar no form, and I'm not missing it, um, not at all. So it's something that you could try and you might find a big, uh, big difference there. Our next question. You spoke about food combinations. Please just remind us what combinations is preferred for good brain function? So I'm going to take you to a, a graph that uh, I borrowed from Professor Walter Feit in uh, his book on uh, natural eating. And um, he gives us uh, this graph of compatible and incompatible foods. And we, we actually find a lot of uh, digestive problems because we, we don't follow this principle. So... The principle hinges on the fact that there's certain food that's neutral. You can eat them with either fruits or vegetables. Now, you might ask why, and we did look at it in our session. I'm just uh, recapping. Um, why fruit and vegetables not in the same category? Because they're all vegetation. What is the reason? Well, the reality is fruits digest very quickly. Fruits digest within uh, one and a half, two hours. Whereas vegetables would, um, would only digest in three and a half, four hours. And so what would happen is if I eat fruit and veg at the same time, um, at the same meal, the fruit would be digested. And while uh, the, 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 it's now waiting for the, for the um, 
uh, vegetables to digest, the fruits uh, would get um, good off. It would go off. It would go fraught. And that means it, it, uh, there's a toxic load. And so we want to avoid that. So we want to eat neutral things with the fruits. If you look at that chart, and we want to eat neutral things with vegetables at one meal. So we'll have a fruit and neutral meal, and we'll have a vegetable and a neutral meal. And the basic reason why we would separate this and making it compatible or not compatible is because of the sugar content of that, uh, of that fruit or of that vegetable. So you'll see the neutral things. There is even fruits that are neutral like avocados, like uh, tomatoes and olives. Um, there's some vegetables that are, um, that are compatible. And so I could use them either way. And uh, they, they are in that category. And so is all seeds, so is all uh, nuts, and so is all legumes and all grains. Um, I hope that that answers that question. I need to say to you that I am so proud of those that faithfully looked and listened to these presentations day after day. Some of you um, have, have looked at them at one lot. I've had many males. I, I understand the realities of life. But my, my wish to you is that you would experience soaring like an eagle rather than scratching like a chicken. If you have more questions, please use the, the question link and send your question to us. We will arrange another question and answer session to answer some of these questions. Um, some new topics has been developed to help uh, address some of these and uh, we are even looking at a follow-up series um, called uh, Goodbye Disease to help uh, us understand some of the principles of avoiding some of these lifestyle diseases like hypertension and diabetes and arthritis and even cancer. Um, and you know my history, I've been a cancer survivor and so the principles that I've used and uh, God has given to me, I am sharing that with you. And we would like you to, to have a, a different outcome in your own life. So may God bless you. May God guide you. And may God give you the wisdom that he gave Daniel and his friends so that they would, um, at the end of the day, uh, be the second in charge of Babylon. And this is what happened. So uh, may the Lord help you as you make decisions to really, to really fly and not to scratch. It was great uh, presenting this to you and may God bless you for the future. I wonder if you would mind if I pray with you. Close your eyes with me as we pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity we had to, to be together for this whole period in looking at some of the principles of, of expanding the brain capacity. And Lord, we, we know there's so much more that we can look at and, and, and have to look at. But we pray that we would go and apply these principles and uh, be, be prepared for amazing results. And that we would share those results with others. And that we would spread the word so that we would have a healthier people, a healthier nation, and a more cognitive, uh, brain-functioning country and people. Thank you, Lord, for, for answering this prayer. I pray for each one that that has looked at this, um, this program. And those that will still look, we ask a blessing on them. And this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Well, you need to stay safe. Keep healthy. Make good decisions. 
This is my prayer for you. Keep well.